This is a brief video on VQ mismatch. And within here, I want you to be able to apply the ventilation perfusion paradigm and then be able to explain the differences between shunt, dead space, and VQ mismatch. Before we do that, we need some foundational concepts. We need to be able to understand what functional residual capacity is, the association between ventilation and lung compliance, and the association between pulmonary perfusion and pulmonary vascular resistance. Let's start with functional residual capacity. Within pulmonology, there are lots of different types of lung volumes and capacities, but I think there are two that I want to focus on right now. One is normal tidal volume, what we do every day when we don't even think about it. We breathe in and we breathe out. And at the end of breathing out, we have a certain amount of volume left in the lungs. This is called functional residual capacity. It happens passively. It is completely a function of the recoil of the chest wall pulling out and the elastins of the lungs pulling in. And where that meets passively is where your remaining volume of lung is after each tidal volume. To put this a little bit more in context, I have a question for you. What is the most likely pressure within each of the alveoli at functional residual capacity here in Salt Lake City? Is it a positive pressure, either positive five, positive one? Or is it atmospheric pressure? Or is it a negative pressure? Is it negative one, negative five? Now the answer is it's actually atmospheric pressure. And this is because FRC happens passively and your airway is open. And when nothing is moving in or out, your pressure is the exact same as atmosphere. When you're pushing air out, the pressure in the lungs are positive. When you're sucking air in, the pressure of the lungs is negative. And when you're at rest at the end of expiration and the airway is open, the pressure is the exact same in your lungs as it is in the atmosphere. And again, this is because the opposing elastic recoil forces of the lungs and the chest wall are in equilibrium. And there's no exertion by the diaphragm or their other respiratory muscles. Now, understanding what functional residual capacity is, is an important concept. And maybe another way to do it is just to breathe normally and then stop yourself. And at the end of expiration, that's functional residual capacity. Residual volume occurs when you force out a reserve volume at the end of expiration. So I'm breathing normally. <clears throat> and then after I force it out, what's remaining in there is the residual volume. And there's no way I can get rid of that. Now let's talk about ventilation. Ventilation equals V in the VQ mismatch. And ventilation is driven by the change in lung volume. And the change in lung volume is completely dependent on the compliance of the lungs. And if you remember, compliance is equal to the change in volume over the change in pressure. Let's look at a graph of ventilation and lung compliance. You have pressure on one axis and volume on the other. As pressure increases, you have volume, but at first it happens slowly, then it hits a sweet spot and it increases a lot, and then at some point, it doesn't change at all. So the sweet spot is right here. This sweet spot where a small change in pressure creates a large change in volume occurs when your lungs are at functional residual capacity. I'll say this again. The best compliance in your lungs occurs when your lungs are at functional residual capacity. If your lungs are over distended, there's not much change in volume. If your lungs are under distended, there's also not that much change in volume because compliance is worse at both of those points. Now let's move on to perfusion. Perfusion in this equation is Q, VQ mismatch. And perfusion is primarily driven by pulmonary vascular resistance. Now let's look at a graph of lung volume versus pulmonary vascular resistance. And what you can see is that when the lungs are small, when they're at residual volume, and again, residual volume is the volume of lungs after you do this, <coughs> that's residual volume, your pulmonary vascular resistance is very high. And if you make your lungs huge, which is total lung capacity, as large as you can expand the lungs, 
your pulmonary vascular resistance is high as well. But the sweet spot where the pulmonary vascular resistance is the least occurs at FRC. And this is because there are different types of blood vessels surrounding the alveoli. When you have high lung volume, the alveolar vessels are compressed. And because of this, you have high vascular resistance. When you have low lung volume, your extra alveolar vessels are compressed. Again, at low lung volumes, you have high pulmonary vascular resistance. And at high lung volumes, you have high pulmonary vascular resistance. And because of this, you have worse pulmonary blood flow. So optimal blood flow occurs at FRC. Let's apply this to VQ mismatch. Ventilation goes in one direction, from zero to infinity. Perfusion, let's assume, goes in the opposite direction, again, from zero to affinity. There is a place right in the middle where you have optimal ventilation and perfusion where everything is matched one to one, where there is absolutely no mismatch. And this is what occurs in normal life when we breathe at normal tidal volume when we are not sick. We call this optimal FRC. What would occur if you have infinite perfusion and zero ventilation? Well, that's shunt. And again, shunt occurs in congenital heart disease when there's a hole in the heart because you have all of this blood flow going through the septum and none of it going through the lungs where ventilation occurs. But can, this can also happen in some lung diseases as well where you have lots of blood flow, but no ventilation. And remember, shunt doesn't respond to oxygen because there's no ventilation at all. On the other side of the continuum where you have infinite ventilation and zero blood flow, you have dead space. Now, dead space happens normally in the trachea, but you can have increased dead space as well where you have a ton of ventilation and zero blood flow. Think of diseases that cause obstruction where you have over-enlarged alveoli like COPD or asthma. In some of those cases, you actually get pathologic dead space. Again, think of ventilation perfusion on a continuum and right in the middle where everything is perfectly matched you have one-to-one -one ventilation. This occurs in optimal FRC when you don't have lung disease. Let's see if we can apply this to some real life examples. I want you to look at all four of these x-rays and identify the x-ray which has optimal VQ matching. It's this x-ray. This is a normal x-ray, which is normal functional residual capacity. And here is an example of all those tidal volumes. And functional residual capacity is, again, the remaining volume in your lungs after normal tidal volume. Now let's compare that to someone with restrictive disease, where the functional residual capacity is smaller than a normal optimal FRC. And when this occurs, these alveoli units are falling closer to shunt on that VQ mismatch continuum. Now there are two x-rays here that have restrictive lung disease. And let's see if we can identify them. Pick them out. Here's a classic restrictive lung disease. This is actually an x-ray of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. They have decreased FRC. It's smaller than normal and these patients present with hypoxemia. Another restrictive lung disease is scoliosis. They also have smaller than normal FRC, and because of this, they can present with hypoxemia. Now let's compare normal to an obstructed x-ray, where the FRC is larger than normal. And because of this, on the VQ mismatch continuum, they're closer to dead space. Here's an x-ray of someone with COPD or asthma. They have hyperexpanded lungs and increased FRC, and these patients primarily present actually with CO2 problems. So why do we care about functional residual capacity? Well, at optimal functional residual capacity, you have optimal lung compliance. You have the best tidal volumes, the best V. You also have optimal pulmonary vascular resistance, which is the best perfusion, the best Q. And so if you get the perfect functional residual capacity 
you have optimal VQ, which gives you the best oxygenation and ventilation. This occurs in all of us naturally at normal tidal volume. But when we're sick, that optimal functional residual capacity goes away. We either have too much functional residual capacity, which is obstructive disease, or too little functional residual capacity, which is restrictive disease. And this is an important concept to remember when you think about how we treat respiratory diseases with mechanical ventilation. And with that, I'll end this video. Please let me know if you have feedback.